emancipatory politics today. If you want to know more about Platypus, feel free to look into platypus1917.org. So Victor will be speaking for about 40 minutes uninterrupted. And afterwards, we will open up the space for questions and discussions. And then you will be able to unmute yourself. So with no further ado, Victor, we're all yours. All right, thank you, uh, Francisco. Just, uh, and thank you all for coming. Just a few uh, notes before about like why this, why now? Um, this is the, I'm going to be reading notes. Um, originally, most of this uh, were notes that I wrote in preparation for a conference that I participated in on the question of uh, what can psychoanalysis say about the far right. It was organized in Copenhagen in September and I've uh, updated it, added a few more things. So partly it's, it is aimed at, uh, originally aimed at that audience, but it's also, uh, I think, um, very much a way of taking stock of what's happened over the past four years and specifically over this past year in the light of these past four years and in the light of the past few centuries. Um, so, yes, and, and uh, in relation to this, I have uh, posted on the event a number of recommended readings, uh, sort of bibliography, if you're curious uh, for like all the stuff I've read or some of the stuff I've read that uh, helped me compose this. And a lot of the things that we in Platypus uh, and on the Platypus Review have published about uh, these questions over the past few years. All right. Um, and I don't have any slides, so this is going to be uh, intensely boring, and I apologize for that. Um, but I can see your faces, and so if you uh, have your uh, cam on, I can see how bored you are, and I can try to uh, alleviate that a little bit. Um, all right, so the crisis of neoliberalism manifested in 2016 with both the election of Trump as US president and the Brexit vote. Um, and this crisis has sparked a renewed interest in authoritarianism and the Frankfurt School's concept of the authoritarian personality on the left. Uh, for instance, it led to the re-edition in 2019 of the authoritarian personality book, which Adorno co-wrote, as well as of his conference entitled Aspects of the New Right Extremism in 2020. It also sparked various commentaries and attempts at act actualizing Adorno's argument such as a 2018 volume entitled Authoritarianism, Three Inquiries and Critical Theory, with essays by Wendy Brown, uh, Peter Gordon, Max Pensky. And the Platypus Review has itself published for the first time uh, Adorno's uh, remarks on the authoritarian personality, as well as commentaries in November 2016, um, and a slender volume entitled Marxism in the Age of Trump, that also addresses the question of the authoritarian personality and authoritarianism today. Um, the conference by Copenhagen-based organization Problema, to which this text was originally responding to, which asked uh, what can psychoanalysis say about the far right in September 2020, was a late example of that trend. Two questions lay behind this renewed interest, a Trump and Brexit contemporary manifestations of what Adorno called the authoritarian personality, and what role can Frankfurt School style critical theory play in making sense of these phenomena. Orthodox Freudian psychoanalysis plays an important role in Adorno's concept of the authoritarian personality. As Adorno put it, uh, our whole study um, so uh, in, in his text on the, the book, on the authority and personality, our whole study, though its subject matter falls into the area of social psychology, is in full harmony with psychoanalysis in its more orthodox Freudian version. 
and on theoretical grounds, our group opposed the attempts to sociologize psychoanalysis through the softening of basic concepts. So in, in saying this, Adorno was uh, setting his effort, uh, his project, very firmly in opposition to the revisionism of someone like Fromm, uh, who Adorno had repeatedly criticized. Uh, and as Peter Brown clarifies, uh, even more perhaps than Freud directly, uh, the early Frankfurt School, and Adorno in particular, drew inspiration from Wilhelm Reich's uh, character analysis and particularly from his uh, Mass Psychology of Fascism, which was published in 1933. And even though there's been a lot of renewed interest in uh, Adorno over the past few years, um, Wilhelm Reich himself, who did write the first uh, Marxist book on the psychology of uh, fascism, uh, has remained very much out of the picture. Um, even though some of Reich's work were re-edited also a few years ago, but in a different context. Um, so, um, boom, boom, boom. so as perhaps, as I said, the first full length work dedicated to the study of fascism written by a practicing Marxist psychoanalysis, psychoanalyst, moreover written and published as fascism and as net natism were still taking shape, Reich's work can illuminate, if not our present situation, at least the necessities, possibilities, and limits of psychoanalysis when faced with a phenomenon like fascism. So in what follows, I try to answer the following questions. Why did Reich believe it both possible and necessary to mobilize Freudian concepts to understand the rise of natism in Germany? What did he perceive to be the limits or mistakes that this might involve? What did characterize this mass psychology of fascism? What did the Frankfurt School mean by authoritarianism beyond the mere phenomenon of fascism? And what might this mean for contemporary attempts to mobilize psychoanalysis in order to understand phenomena such as Trump or Brexit? And to put it very briefly, my answer to all of these questions are is the following that for Reich, it is the disintegration of the Marxist party from 1914 onwards, which makes it both possible and necessary to rely on Freudian concepts in order, first of all, to understand the workers' own authoritarian personality structure, which led to that disintegration of Marxism in the first place. Uh, yet such a use of Freudian concepts should properly lead to a rediscovery of orthodox Marxism, not to its replacement or complementation with a different heterogeneous theory, and certainly not to the pathologization of Nazi voters or to psychologically reform individuals from their authoritarianism. The Frankfurt School more broadly understood fascism to be only one form of the authoritarian state, with the New Deal welfare state and the USSR embodying other forms of the same authoritarian state, and relying just as much on the authoritarian personality, uh, which is why Adorno could carry out his study of the authoritarian personality in the US, which didn't have a fascist movement in which was not a fascist state. Uh, contemporary attempts at mobilizing authoritarianism and the authoritarian personality must contend with the widespread nature of both among leaders and movements that they might consider to be left-wing, as well as with the diminished plausibility of psychoanalysis as the bourgeois society which produced the Freudian individual has largely disintegrated. That was a sort of really dense summary of what I'm going to say right now. So it should be a clearer. All right, so why did orthodox Marxists such as William Reich, Ole Benjamin Adorno use concepts inherited from Freudian psychoanalysis? We should remember uh, that similar attempts were roundly criticized by Lenin uh, only a decade prior. Right? And so Lenin uh, said that the extension of Freudian hypotheses seems educated, even scientific, but it is ignorant 
bungling. There's no place for it in the party, in the class conscious fighting proletariat. Yet far from being a heretical move to correct Marxism or to complement its understanding of material conditions with supposed science of subjectivity, the introduction of psychoanalysis into theory was meant by Wilhelm Reich as a return to Marxism in the context and the, the orthodox Marxism of Lenin um, in the context of the practical disappearance of the party and of class consciousness more broadly. Fascism as the inheritor and caricature of socialism itself was the prime symptom of the death of the party, of the failure of the revolution. But Hayek also considered the economism of both the social democrats and the communist parties to be further symptoms, as well as uh, what Hayek uh, called the camouflaging of defeats and the covering of important facts with illusions that he felt was widespread at the time, in the way that defeat was presented as some sort of victory, the USSR, the Stalinian USSR. Thus, the very idea that Marxism describes material economic factors and that psychoanalysis would serve to address a subjective factor out of the reach of Marxism that very idea was a symptom of the crisis to be analyzed and not the solution. The left's refusal or inability to take fascism seriously was another manifestation of these symptoms. The Social Democrat and the Stalinian parties presented the rise of the Nazi party as a product of the workers' irrationality, that is their inability to recognize their interests in a moment of economic crisis. Virgin Marxism, which is the name that the revolutionary Marxists gave to the revisionists of their time, capitulates to the existing order of things and collapses itself into an analysis of economic factors, uh, what Reich uh, called uh, to the problem of unemployment and pay rates. That vulgar Marxism, now as Stalinism, expected the crisis of 1929, 1933, uh, to necessarily lead to a move of the masses to the left. But instead, it moved, this crisis moved the proletariat further to the right. Instead of analyzing that contradiction, intellectuals pathologized the working class response as psychotic or chauvinistic. And you know, there's a very clear parallel to the way uh, intellectuals, uh, Marxist left-wing intellectuals expected the 2008 crisis uh, and more recently the coronavirus crisis to move people to the left, um, on the what left. And uh, to their dismay, it led to things like uh, uh, Brexit and Trump and uh, intellectuals reacted by sort of pseudo sophisticated versions of Hillary Clinton's uh, basket of deplorables, right? By pathologizing the working class as being somehow misadapted, uh, um, sometimes in a very condescending way, often in a very con condescending way, uh, sometimes in a very angry, aggressive way, wishing the death of all these, you know, working class people and so on. So the pathologization was already a symptom of the failure of Marxism to make sense of its own time in the 1930s. And this is what led to uh, taking seriously psychoanalysis uh, as a discourse of Marxism to make sense of its own time. So psychoanalysis for Reich was to go beyond such facile dismissal of the workers' support for fascism. More specifically, the absence of a socialist party made psychoanalysis necessary for two reasons. First, because the party was itself meant to be the very medium for the apprehension of the dialectical relations between subjectivity and objectivity, but also because the party transformed society and its disintegration left in its wake a disorganized mass of individuals, hence the mass psychology of fascism and not the class psychology of fascism. <clears throat> 
Indeed, the Marxist parties of the Second International were not the mere marketing agencies that they have become today, but they were tasked with both the organization of proletarian civil society and for and through this organization, an understanding of its contradictions and more broadly of the contradictions of capitalism itself, of capitalist society, in order to guide the masses in revolutionary action. Controversies when they opposed, whether they opposed revisionists and orthodox Marxists in the German SPD on the relation between reform and revolutions, or Mensheviks and Bolsheviks in the Russian Social Democratic Labour Party were treated by Orthodox Marxists like Lenin and Rosa Luxemburg as an index of the transformation of the party, but also of the proletariat, but also of capitalism, and as indicators of the possibility for revolution. This ended when the SPD in power in Germany commanded the murder of Rosa Luxemburg at the hands of the pre-fascist Freikorps, and when Russian party bureaucrats helped Stalin take control of the Third International. So Freud's work in the 30s could lend itself to a Marxist appropriation, according to Reich, because uh, of his recognition of the historical nature of subjectivity, and particularly of the pathologies produced by the crisis of labor and the family in capitalism. Reich highlights the following of Freud's discoveries that he thinks are useful for Marxism, are amenable to a Marxist uh, reappropriation. First, that consciousness is driven by psychic processes, which are not accessible to conscious control. Second, that sexuality is the prime motor of psychic life from infancy onwards. Third, that childhood sexuality is repressed out of fear of punishment, and thus manifests itself all the stronger in pathological disturbances of the mind. And four, that morality is the incorporation of that external prohibition, right? And so in, in that sense, we have a, a link between consciousness and morality with uh, uh, the oppression, the suppression of sexuality, and especially uh, in children. Now, Freud thought that repression itself is necessary for all of cultural civilization to exist. That is, for humans to forego pleasure and to work, we need to suppress uh, sexuality. Uh, sorry, for, for humans to go to work in order to survive, we need to forego pleasure. Um, for Reich, this was uh, not specific enough. And there is a more specific history to the repression of sexuality. And in particular, it's uh, thriving as a result of the specific form of the exploitation of human labor under capitalism. Sexual repression turns into a moral defense, withdraws sexuality from consciousness and prevents rebellion against the suppression of both material and sexual needs. Uh, as I put it, uh, the result is conserv conservatism, fear of freedom, in a word, reactionary thinking. These, uh, instead, these sexual needs find a substitute gratification in brutal sadism and in masochism. Uh, for example, and these are examples that Reich gives the counter girls uh, sexual desire for marching officers and the young men's desire to join the army to uh, travel to foreign countries, that is to have sex with prostitutes abroad or to rape, uh, uh, you know, French women uh, in conquered land, right? According to Marx, the crisis of labor so in order to understand what Reich understood by that uh, specificity of the need, the surplus need to repress sexuality in late capitalism, we have to go back to Marx's understanding of uh, labor under capitalism. 
According to Marx, the, cri the crisis of labor, which also manifests as an excessive repression of sexuality for Reich, expresses the core contradiction of bourgeois society under the industrial mode of production. Bourgeois society was based on the free exchange of labor, more particularly on the, on the value of labor time, on wage labor. The development of bourgeois society had deprived European nobility from much of its power and yet continued to live under its law. For Adam Smith, such a society would guarantee ever greater wealth for all for ever less effort as labor became more efficient. And yet with the Industrial Revolution, the atomization of labor rendered its value, the value of labor, self-contradictory. Indeed, the workers made the machines that would replace them, actively destroying the value of their own labor as they worked, leading to both overwork and underwork, that is, mass unemployment, uh, but also to economic crises that periodically disrupted the whole of social life. For Marx, uh, this manifested politically as a uh, uh, two different apparently opposed phenomena, socialism and Bonapartism. Uh, he saw this clearly in events that he uh, lived through, the revolution of 1848, uh, which was a political manifestation of an economic crisis. The call for socialism for th the social republic that emerged at that time expressed the increased social socialization of production, but, but missed its self-contradictory nature and only demanded the full realization of the value of labor, right? Uh, workers demanding to uh, be paid uh, a full day's work. The election of a socialist uh, Louis Napoleon Bonaparte showed the impasse of such a demand. Uh, he managed the crisis by alternatingly supporting different sectors of society, now the unemployed, now the petty bourgeoisie, now the peasants, all the while increasing the power of the, of the state over society through the police and through the army in order to repress discontent and to give work to the lumpen proletariat. Right, to those who were um, uh, um, who lie out, who lay outside of normal work, right? Uh, the the rabble. When uh, Napoleon Bonaparte crowned himself emperor in order to protect universal suffrage and democracy, he fully expressed the self contradictory nature of bourgeois society under capitalism. For Marx, this did not mean that the bourgeois revolutions had been hypocritical or delusional, but rather that their success had produced the potential for heretofore unimaginable forms of freedom. It was this unfulfilled potential which expressed itself as political repression. More specifically, both the potential of industrial production and its repression were the responsibility of the workers themselves. They made both the machine and the revolution, and they gave up on both by choosing themselves a master, shying away from the overcoming of capitalism and unable to learn from their failure. What was needed then was an organization dedicated to maintaining a consciousness of history and of articulating the self contradiction contradictory relations between labor and capital, the realization of class and its overcoming. The first step that such an organization would take would be to carry out the revolution to its term and not to abandon power to the bourgeoisie halfway through. Authoritarianism, though a symptom of the self-contradictory nature of bourgeois society under the industrial mode of production, was not to be avoided but worked through. As Engels put it, a revolution is certainly the most authoritarian thing there is. It is the act whereby one part of the population imposes its will upon the other part by means of rifles, bayonets, and cannon. Authoritarian means, if such there be at all. And if the victorious party does not want to have fought in vain, it must maintain this role by means of the terror 
which its arms inspire in the reactionists. Would the Paris Commune have lasted a single day if it had not made use of this authority of the armed people against the bourgeois? Should we not, on the contrary, reproach it for not having used it freely enough? And so that was Engels on authoritarianism. So for Marxism, authoritarianism is not some uh, um, beast to avoid at all costs, but it is a non unnecessary. Uh, and there's a word. Um, it's a necessity that needs to be worked through and to be put to use in order for capitalism to overcome itself. So back to Reich. For Reich, fascism should be understood on the basis of Marxism, it should rely on psychoanalysis because of the failure of the party and serves to discover the emancipatory potential of fascism. That is the workers desire for freedom, which fascism both expressed and recoiled from. In the same way as for Freud, uh, neurosis expressed both a desire for sexual freedom and the repression of that desire. Reich takes the example of rebelling soldiers during the 1905 Russian Revolution, who having successfully risen up against their immediate commanders, capitulated before the rest of the hierarchy and gave themselves up for slaughter. As he puts it, in their, in, their office, uh, in their offices, the soldiers of 1905 unconsciously perceived their childhood father, condensed in a conception of God, who denied sexuality and whom one could neither kill nor want to kill, though they shattered one's joy of life. Both their repentance and their irresolution subsequent to the seizure of power were an expression of its opposite, hate, transformed into pity, which as such could not be translated into action. Right, and that's the problem for Reich. How do we transform this into action? How do we uh, stop us from, or how do we stop the workers from stopping themselves from acting? Another example that he takes, which for him signaled the end of revolutionary Marxism, was the embrace by the workers of the 1914 war, which alone could make possible the carnage that followed. And what we could add as well was uh, uh, the socialist, Social Democratic Party arriving in power in Germany in 1918 and using that power to murder the revolutionaries and to give power to the fascists. The Frankfurt School expanded on Hayek's insights and generalized them beyond the special case of fascism. For them, the authoritarian state described more broadly the different regressive, that is barbaric state forms that emerge in response to the crisis of 1929. As Marx, Kautsky and Rosa Luxemburg, the choice that had been posted, posed was between an intensification of barbarism or the transition to socialism. The restructuration of capitalism after 1929 took the form of a liquidation of liberalism and its replacement with the authoritarian state, as fascism in Italy and Germany, as central planning in the USSR, or as the welfare state in, welfare in Western Europe and the US. The authoritarian state was marked by a regression to neo-feudal relations of domination, yet in a hyper-modern form that mimicked the industrial process, right, the bureaucratic state. This raised questions concerning the possibility for psychoanalysis to continue making sense as a critical analytic in this brave new world. As Adorno put it, the administered society is that in which the proletarian housewife, who used to be afraid of her drunken husband, is now more terrified of her social worker. This also meant, according to Adorno, the disappearance of the Oedipus complex, as the state, now both father and mother, cannot ever be competed with. And Adorno notes in Minima Moralia that what remains from Oedipus is parricide, the murder of the father and of the mother, in fact, without desire for the mother or competition with the father. 
parasite in instead to efface the emancipatory possibilities contained in those patriarchal relations. And, and as I mentioned, right, for Reich, uh, uh, her competition with the father and the desire and impossibility to murder the father was crucial to the possibility for uh, uh, emancipa emancipation. Uh, for Adorno, what he saw in the relation in the generation coming out of the 40s was uh, uh, an abandonment even of that conflict, of all conflict. As bourgeois society uh, disintegrated, so did the very possibility of individuality, which Freudian psychoanalysis aimed at increasingly, uh, uh, sorry, as bourgeois society disintegrated, so did the very possibility of individuality, uh, which Freudian psychoanalysis aimed at. Individuality became increasingly out of reach, utopian even, as did love. Instead, as Christopher Lash has argued, under siege, the self contracts to a defensive core armed against adversity and uh, hence a retreat into what Christopher Lash called narcissism. While psychotherapy turned into a technique to adapt patients to society, to ensure their mere survival. Psychotherapy is there to uh, keep people alive at all costs. 20 years after Lash, uh, French psychoanalyst Charles Melman would describe an age where addictive need has replaced all form of desire. And after him, Jean-Pierre Lebrun uh, described a, a, a psychological structure dominated by perversion, a whole society dominated by perversion. So uh, a, a retreat again into uh, infantile uh, uh, narcissism. We can thus conclude that at least from the perspective of the Marxist appropriation of Freudian psychoanalysis by Wilhelm Reich in the Frankfurt School, the possibility of using the concept of authoritarianism in the age of Trump and to understand what, the, uh, what the, that conference organized by Problema called the rise of the new right must be circumscribed. Not that the objective structures that gave rise to the authoritarian state and the authoritarian personality have disappeared, quite the opposite, but rather because the wish to provide a psychopathological diagnostic of Trump and Brexit voters may be wrong-headed. First and foremost, Trump is not and cannot be more of a phenomenon of authoritarianism than, for example, Obama was, or that uh, Biden will be, and in fact, probably less so. Obama deported more migrants than Trump, killed more civilians abroad than Trump, and Trump did not start new imperialist wars, uh, nor did he condemn whistleblowers like Manning, Assange, and Snowden uh, to uh, exile or torture. Nor is the so-called new right necessarily more authoritarian than the current left. It might be more consciously authoritarian or explicitly authoritarian. Uh, it might be happier of its authoritarianism, but uh, that doesn't make it more authoritarian than the current left. The past few years, and especially the past year, have been rich in pathological expressions of authoritarianism by self-proclaimed leftists. If Freudian psychoanalysis aimed at re-establishing the, uh, the analysis ability for love and work, two central forms that freedom took in bourgeois societies, and which had become uh, mutually contradictory, as I indicated, Self-avowed leftists in 2020 have portrayed the desire for both, the desire for love, the desire for work, as problematic, which is a millennial lingo for morally indefensible. David Fess, uh, who's here tonight, has argued that when millennials are confronted with the emotion surrounding desire, for which they already did not have the disposition, they further placate the anxieties with the screen image of abuse, the childish identification with either the prey or the predator 
prematurely resolves what is still at play emotionally and moreover condemns the mutually transactional character of romance. Rather than recognizing romance as a social relation of mutual self-possession and exchange, millennials neatly divide men and women and project this division upon all eternity as if men only want sex and women only want relationships. That was a few years ago. Uh, hence, the millennial left's pathological fear of sex, projection of abnormal sexuality onto political enemies, and attempts at controlling the sexual lives of at least other leftists. This 2020 series, uh, I May Destroy You, really good series, uh, by the way, uh, presents uh, the archetypal millennial sex panic. Uh, but one that goes beyond the diagnostic that uh, David um, had presented a few years ago, where it's not just men and women, but where men and white people generally do not just want sex, but they want rape and only rape, and they're only able to rape, uh, where in fact all penetration is rape, and where women and black people only want self-care. Um, and in that series, the only sort of redeemed uh, male characters are uh, an asexual white man who spends his time watering his plants and never leaves his flat, and uh, a black uh, trans man. All right, uh, and it's sort of implied that the absence, uh, that he, because he's pre-op, that the absence of a penis is what allows him to not rape people in spite of being a man. So sex has become suspicious uh, for the millennials. Work as well has become suspicious. In 2020, the image of a child holding a placard with the word work is freedom during an anti-lockdown protest in the spring was widely circulated among leftists, supposedly to prove the neo-Nazi allegiances of Trump voters. The words Arbeitmarkt frei at the entrance of the Auschwitz concentration camp which were meant at the time to mock the bourgeoisie, the bourgeois revolutions uh, by violently enforcing slave labor, were taken by leftists as a literal pronouncement of Nazi ideology. Uh, as a result, the bourgeois emancipation from feudalism through wage labor, which that child inherited, that revolutionary promise was denounced as its antithesis as the concentration camp. Instead, leftists were content to be told by Mette Frederiksen or Jacinda Ardern to stay home like grounded children and wanted to enforce this and shame anyone who dared do or who dared desire and hope for something different. Further, as Chris Cotron has put it, in narcissistic authoritarian society, everyone becomes trapped in a static and self-reinforcing identity where the need was actually to allow the opening up to non-identity of freedom, the freedom to overcome oneself allowed by the healthy ego for Freud. The millennial left's uh, humorlessness and attempts to control speech, thought, and art alike, its obsession with identity categories and anger at transgression, its fascination for mysticism like astrology or authoritarian forms of Islam, or the sadomasochistic violence of its meaningless protests have long demonstrated its own authoritarianism. This became particularly clear over the summer as protests against police violence became the occasion to enforce strict racial divisions and bully people into behaving like their attributed race. Black people who even dared to question whether they individually should vote for Joe Biden and the Democratic Party were called, in Biden's words, not black or Uncle Tom's um, and relentlessly bullied on social media and in real life until they would recant. We should also remember the onslaught of uh, uh, um, unveilings, uh, denunciations of white, especially white women who uh, had portrayed themselves as somehow black or uh, Latino.
of a non-white heritage and who were forced into demeaning apologies, right? Black people have to be black and behave like black people and white people have to be white and behave like white people uh, for the millennial left. And they spend the summer disciplining us. Um, those who questioned the usefulness of racism as an explanatory factor for social inequality and unrest in the USA were canceled and deplatformed, as Adolf Fried Jr., uh, for example. And the very uh, questioning of this was taken to be proto fascistic, right? Uh, isn't he called Adolf, as uh, uh, one of my colleagues put it? More recently, leftists have enthusiastically participated in police efforts to identify, shame, and arrest participants in the Capitol protests. Whining and snitching have become the left's modus operandi. Finally, uh, the protests that took place throughout the US and Europe over the summer also demand to be seen as a demand for authoritarianism. Although the protests explicitly demanded the abolition of the police, their form, content, and consequences show that this was instead a demand for intensified policing of social life under new forms. The protests, whether peaceful or violent, did not form part of a strategy to take over the state, but rather to express demands loud enough uh, so that our overlords may hear them and benevolently act for the people. Uh, the violence that was at times exercised pointlessly aimed at nothing else than to provoke the police into action, a desperate attempt to have the father, our father, the state, show his tough love for his children. Those demanding the abolition of the police were quick to clarify that this meant increasing the amount of social workers and community policing as well as uh, managerial policing of uh, workers. Um, and ultimately all of this led to Biden's choosing for his running mate, California's top cop, Kamala Harris, and uh, as well as his plan, their plan to start uh, his mandate with a new stricter set of anti-terrorism laws, and that is authoritarian laws, right? Um, it is important to emphasize that we should not expect the left to be less authoritarian than the right or not authoritarian at all. Uh, because the authoritarian personality does not result from a lack of education or moral failing any more than the authoritarian state results from the moral corruption of its elites, but rather from the contradiction between border society and the industrial mode of production. Left authoritarianism is already being mobilized to political ends, uh, for example, by the Democratic Party to keep Afro-Americans, women and young people as captive constituencies, guaranteed voters, to keep electing their old, ineffective and corrupt politicians. The only way out is through the mobilization of that authoritarianism, but by a socialist party, uh, not to re-elect uh, the Democratic Party, but uh, to carry out the dictatorship of the proletariat and the overcoming of capitalism. Were we to forget this, all of this, the left's authoritarianism, we would certainly uh, be able to continue having a lot of fun using Freud and Lacan to make fun of the basket of deplorable, uh, deplorables, the Hicks and the rednecks who are silly enough to vote for that evil orange man or the other guy with the funny hair in the UK um, uh, or the, you know, the, 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 the stupidity, the stupid uh, desire to leave the sweet embrace of the motherly European Union. Uh, we could continue to wish them ruin, illness, death, and to mistake the end of neoliberalism for the end of the world, as much of the self-professed left has done publicly and in private since 2016. Giving free reign to infantile sadomasochism sure is enjoyable, but it will not help the left face its own responsibility in the traumatic history of the never ending 20th century. Therefore, even less to take the necessary steps towards redeeming that history. That is, we should use psychoanalytic concepts not to explain, and if we are to use them. 
right? Uh, we should use them not to explain away the rise of the far right, but to perceive in it, even in its most grotesque and pathological manifestations, the potential for freedom whose failure it embodies. In the same way, again, that in uh, hysteria, uh, Freud was recognizing the suppression of sexuality, but also the desire for sexuality and for freedom that was expressed uh, by hysteria. Finally, we should also remember that if we are left with psychoanalysis, it is as a desperate measure, a last resort, at least until a socialist party, an organization dedicated to the overcoming of capitalism through the dictatorship of the proletariat, makes more fruitful forms of analysis possible. As Omer Hussein put it, this is the real pathology of the left. It continually reconstitutes the domination it wants to overcome precisely on the basis of its discontent against this domination. What would it mean to overcome this pathology? Platypus has no answer. All we can do, like Freud, is attempt to provoke recognition in the patient of its pathology. Freud's goal was to strengthen the ego of the patient through self-consciousness. If the patient could be made conscious of the pathology, perhaps that would point to its overcoming. We seek to incite uh, the same kind of self-recognition and self-overcoming on the left. Freud's goal was to increase the patient's freedom through self-mastery. Our goal is the same, but for the history of humanity. Or if that was amazing. And that's me. Thank you very much. I can't hear you, but we're going to um, allow you to speak now. You can unmute yourselves now. <clears throat> All right, thanks a lot. Yeah, now we're open for questions. Omer, were you gonna, just gonna ask a question? I wasn't gonna ask a question, I was just gonna add to something Victor said, but if there are questions first, maybe that would be better to take. No, I think you should go ahead. Okay, I just wanted to specify something Victor kind of raised, which is, uh, in mass society in the 20th century, the liquidation of the ego and how that kind of happens, for Adorno at least, that for Freud, the confrontation with the father figure as an authority was essential to building an ego. What Adorno sees in the 20th century is that the family structure itself is being liquidated in which you, know, you recognize your parents as impotent from an early age. So that superego no longer becomes the father but becomes a kind of effervescent abstract society in general. Right? We're socialized by television, by our peer groups. And the fact that superego becomes society in general is something that we can't concretize in the figure of the father leads to a kind of a undermining of that confrontation with authority in which we all identify with the superego as society and thereby liquidate our abilities to develop an ego. So I just want to kind of specify that point, that it's about the kind of uh, liquidation of the father fig figure as the superego. Right, right. And, and it's, it's not like, and I don't know, it's very clear that it's not like uh, there's a possibility of returning to patriarchal, uh, uh, the patriarchal family, or that it would even be uh, desirable. Uh, it was bad. Uh, it's worse now. Uh, and there is a demand. Um, so it's not like uh, uh, it's completely disappeared because there's a demand for it. Right, and those sort of masochistic protests are like a way, uh, or that's at least that's what I've tried to articulate. Right, that there there a, a demand for some sort of authority on the part of the left, and you have on the part of the right more explicitly uh, a demand to return to the part uh, the patriarchal family. Right, uh, so there's a, a conscious or unconscious demand for a return to this, for the possibility of concretizing uh, authority so that it could be uh, competed with and overcome. Um, but uh, it never really gets there, right? It never seems to really uh, go, go forth. Right, the polemical point Adorno will make is that in the 60s, people want to get beaten by the police because it, it supplies them with the authority figure that they're trying to uh, battle that's so effervescent. 
Uh, Danny? Yes, I have a, a question. I, well, first of all, very, uh, very good job. That was great and very um, uh, relevant and pertinent right now. Um, I was wondering if you could, uh, I don't know, kind of think out loud about also um, why people feel such a need to prove the fascism and the others. Like, I'm just thinking of these Capitol Hill protests that happened recently. And unlike Charlottesville, probably the people who uh, were breaking into Capitol Hill probably thought they were actually fighting fascism. Like, it's not like they were like, oh, we are fascists. They would think, oh, this is the fascism of the Democrats in that sense. And how, in a kind of strange irony of history, now the authoritarianism is, you have to believe it's fascism or you're a terrible person. Like I had a flashback during your um, presentation of being on the radio and someone, this was in 2016, and someone like telling me I was a terrible person for not recognizing that Trump was a fascist. Like I was a bad person, an awful, terrible human being in that sense. So I was wondering if you could kind of reflect on that and how that's related to the defeat of the left of the authoritarian character in terms of trying to prove something is fascist. And I think that also goes into the psychoanalytic character. It's not just calling it such, but I'm going to prove to you that it's fascist through a, 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 a complicated theory in that sense. Right, and, and, and what's really striking is that of course they never actually do even really try to prove that it's fascism, right? They, they tend to prove that it's fascism but so uh, lame every time. Uh, and, and so insulting uh, uh, for anyone who knows anything about fascism, right? And so as the way I would think about it, right, is as you say, like fascism has become a moral category. It's not a political one or, or a historical category. It's about being bad. It's about being evil, wanting evil. So Trump is, uh, uh, he just wants bad things for people. Uh, like some sort of uh, uh, Marvel superhero, right? Evil, uh, super villain, sorry. Super right? Uh, he's like uh, Thanos and he just wants to destroy people, even worse than Thanos because Thanos does it for like the good of the universe, but like he just wants bad things. There's no reason for it. And somehow uh, uh, having any form of uh, understanding for uh, Trump's project that of his supporters is being oneself a morally bad person. Um, and so, and that points to, so it's even worse than this. So that points to like the, the collapse between politics and morality uh, that comes partly out of, on the left at least, out of uh, uh, Stalinism, right? And there's a, a, another teaching I want to give hopefully soon enough on Kulakovsky, who I think it was really good at clarifying that collapse of politics and morality, where uh, uh, being a good person is being on the right side of history, which is the side of the winners, um, and, uh, uh, and vice versa, right? And where that's become, that's uh, um, disintegrated further, it's collapsed further uh, with the sort of narcissization of society into self-help uh, or, or self, uh, uh, self-care, as they say, right? That is um, different opinions or especially different political projects are collapsed into different uh, moral projects, which are uh, taken as aggressions on uh, my very survival as a... Uh, uh, not even a person, right, as a sort of proto-subject. And everything is uh, uh, taken to be an attack uh, on my own psychic survival, right? If you dif uh, disagree with me, you're threatening my own uh, survival and your threat to me, which is the, the reason why uh, speech and so on can be uh, controlled, should be controlled today, why uh, Trump uh, shouldn't be allowed to uh, tweet. The Ayatollah Khomeini, no problem, you know, but Trump is a uh, uh, person non grata because he's unsafe, right? Uh, and that's, of course, what's going on in universities uh, uh, all over, at least 
all over the world because I know the same is happening actually in like Pakistan and shit. All right. Um, so um, that I think collapse of morality, politics, and uh, uh, psychic survival is like manifests itself as a sort of intense bullying uh, and this uh, identification of fascism, not with anything in particular, but just with uh, uh, any form of disagreement with the Democratic Party, really. Um, Victor, can I get you to talk a bit more about the issue of political mediation or political representation? Um, I think even in just what you were saying just then, one of the things that occurred to me is that there is a kind of rational kernel to that um, belief that the kind of shake up of political certainties actually destabilizes your own psychic life which is um, the recognition that society, our society is highly politically mediated by the state and by the parties of the state. Um, and, you know, with um, all the kind of Brexit hysteria in the UK, um, the, the kind of establishment liberal position, I guess, was um, if you shake up the two party system, you're actually going to lose control. And it's not worth it. Like, it's really not worth it. Don't so don't start messing around, because you're going to unleash things that you're not going to be able to put back in the box kind of thing. And um, there is a kernel of truth to that, obviously, that the kind of psychic social energies are both kind of channeled and repressed through a highly kind of ornate state political system, even one that um, hides its own functioning in a kind of apolitical veneer. Um, and obviously, you know, another thing that occurred to me when Omer was speaking is the role that in Adorno's analysis of psychoanalysis and fascism um, is uh, the role that's played by the leader figure who has a kind of direct unmediated relationship to the mass um, and who kind of plays this um, psychological substitution role for the superego that is like unable to form because of a kind of stunted psychological development of the, the subject in the mass. Um, and I think what kind of partly what provokes the um, hysteria about fascism in the age of Trump is that kind of um, bypassing of political established forms of political mediation, speaking directly to the base, um, being not really within the bounds of the party. And people, <clears throat> people feared this also in Jeremy Corbyn and Bernie Sanders for instance, and Nigel Farage. Um, and, uh, you know, that um, I think in one of Chris's, in Chris Catron's interviews with Doug Lane, Doug Lane talks about how his mother doesn't like Bernie Sanders because he's like aggressive and shouting, right? And there's this sense that, and, you know, Chris pointed out the kind of anti-Semitic stereotype at play in that, but um, there is this kind of sense of like, the demagogue, right, and the, uh, that kind of bypasses those forms of political mediation. Um, so I think, I don't know, maybe you could say something about that. It obviously goes back very far all the way to uh, Louis Bonaparte. And there are some wonderful lines in Marx's 18th Brumaire about this and the stuff about like, they cannot be represented, they must be represented, that kind of thing about like the lumpen proletariat and and that in Adorno and Horkheimer's kind of assessment of mass society, there's a kind of lumpenization of everything in that sense. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, that, and then the final piece, I guess, is that that you really kind of brought that up as well with the way in which the liquidation of the socialist parties after 19, 
uh, well, after the First World War, really, kind of um, revealed actually what had been so risky about socialism all along, which is basically if you start building up these psychosocial energies in however a channeled and organized form, if you basically don't deliver on the goods, you're going to like, you know, you're going to have led a, an army of people up to the top of a mountain and give them no way of getting back down and shit's going to get bad quite quickly. Um, so yeah, maybe you can just say something about that kind of um, almost like the rational kernel of like contemporary anti-fascism in a, in like crisis of representation and how that relates to that, this issue of authoritarianism. Right, thanks. I mean, the, the, there's a whole lot you brought up. Um, a few things, like the first thing that came to mind was, uh, uh, you know, when leftists uh, on Facebook write, I'm literally shaking, and they're not literally shaking. And yet, you know, it, it, because in fact, like nothing's moving anymore, right? There's sort of no uh, emotionality uh, um, and, and people are so medicated that anyway, they wouldn't know if something was stirring inside of them. Um, and yet indeed, you know, it, uh, you're right. Like this is like people cried when uh, uh, Boris Johnson won the elections last year. Uh, they did cry, even if, uh, uh, they didn't necessarily uh, have much to lose personally in this. Uh, but, you know, you had uh, psychic involvement that wasn't only the sort of superficial uh, uh, identification with a leader at a distance, but as you said, a sort of a need for that to happen uh, or, or for institutions to be preserved or for things to keep going on as they had gone on in their childhood uh, for, for psychic survival to continue um, at a time that had already been marked by like intense upheavals in people's material lives for the past 10 years and especially uh, for academics you know like like for sort of uh, the sort of middle class intellectuals that compose most of uh, the left uh, uh, both as students and then people who are not like unemployed graduates uh, with a lot of student debt uh, uh, and so on. Like there, there's something that is uh, indeed that had produced already a, a really fragile state. Um, the second thing that made me think of was um, I May Destroy You, which I do really think is a great series in how clear it is about what, like how that millennial left feels itself. There's a moment in which um, because it, it's all provoked by, uh, like it all starts with the, the uh, hero um, getting raped, uh, drugged and raped, and then slowly making sense of that. And as part of her self-care, she becomes a sort of political leader on, on Twitter who like uh, leads a sort of Me Too movement uh, on Twitter and Instagram, I think, and maybe Snapchat. And she becomes uh, increasingly authoritarian and, and violent herself. Um, and there's a really nice recognition of, of that and unbearable, like everything and everybody becomes unbearable, but it is in order to just survive, right? To keep, uh, uh, to just not spiral out of control. Um, and then what you said about uh, Bonapartism, right? or about uh, political mediation and how that in a way starts with bonapartism. Uh, what I was thinking was the way in which like this sort of direct relation between the leader and the, the people is both feared by everybody and also desired by everybody. Um, like direct democracy and uh, consultative democracy are like how neoliberalism itself tried to overcome uh, Fordism, uh, right? To overcome the bureaucratic state by having bottom-up decision-making and budget, whatever. Um, and that continues to be also the way uh, all of like this sort of democratic campaigns try to appear at least since Obama, right? 
the sort of uh, Twitter president uh, was already the one that speaks directly to the people that bypasses the Democratic Party and so on. And so uh, I think there's something more complicated at play than just like these new guys disrupting something that was then stable because the old guys had already or are responsible for that destabilizing and you know, they wanted this. Um, and Napoleon was the first president to rule through direct democracy, to run, to rule through referendas. Um, and the, like, you know, when the, the referendum, the Brexit referendum was created by the right, by the conservative government and one that's more conservative than conservative, or more traditionally conservative than uh, uh, Boris Johnson's conservative party, right? So there's something, uh, um, troubling there, uh, I think, there's the fascism of, uh, well, I mean, it's it's Bonapartism, right, in that sense, um, disrupting itself, but reproducing itself uh, in spite of itself in these new forms uh, that do uh, profoundly impact uh, uh, psychic life. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know if that, because it was I would just add one final comment, which just occurred to me, which is like um, the, the role of the millennial left in relationship to that kind of direct democracy, for example, in the Labour Party, which was really encouraging that. And it was seen as a kind of legacy of a new left as a way of overcoming um, the authoritarian, let's say, uh, control that unions had in the party. And the unions were basically, it was basically politics in smoky rooms, right? And that democracy would, you know, I think Christopher Lash has some kind of stuff like this that, you know, people thought they were overcoming the like corruption of backroom politics with direct democracy or with like one member, one vote democracy in the parties. And they actually liquidated the kinds of um, acceptable authority that there were through which they could actually get, you know, achieve their political goals. What's interesting now is the millennial left's like desperate attempt. Now they want to recreate unions. They want to recreate the trade unions and it's presented as a form of like self-care. Mm. Um, like you need the trade union to like look out for your colleagues. Um, yeah. I just watched like the guy on, on the Hill who's just started this Google union and it's all about like, he talks about like self-care yeah. um, and uh, the union as an extension of that. And there is there is this kind of like desire now for some kind of return to political mediation, um, but it's it's being expressed in all these kind of weird ways that, that actually are expressions of its collapse. Right. And, and you know, I, uh, uh bringing the new left into it, as you do, right? Um, I was thinking of David Graeber uh, um, and like the Occupy movement. And uh, um, David Graeber's mentor, Marshall Salins, uh, is the one I think who coined the very term teaching, like, right, that we use uh, precisely as part of the new left, precisely as like we're going to go behind the back of the university and teach directly during the, the Vietnam War. Um, and so like Greber does inherit that thing from the new left, uh, but then it does, you know, of course, turn into like self and mutual care. Uh, what was mutual cooperation, uh, right, becomes uh, mutual care. And like in a way for Occupy, we have to uh, uh, lead through consensus and listen to everybody say anything and never make any decision because otherwise someone might get hurt, right? It might hurt someone's feelings to not be heard. Um, so indeed you have that collapse into inf infantilism of uh, 
anarchism and you know, like of of yeah political forms of mediation even when it was to limit mediation to uh, the maximum and now there's just no mediation at all even when there's a demand of mediation even when it's the unions and so on it's not even to achieve anything and to act it is just to express yourself and like be cared for um and i'm thinking also of uh, what is it Jody dean the whole thing about like comrade being a way you, you know it's better than it's basically how you should treat your friends um you know you should you should call each other comrades because it's sort of uh doesn't just sound good but it's like how to care for people it's mutual care um and so it is that collapse of of politics and morality and and narcissism into one dimension or half dimension Um, could I follow up on some of the points that Ephraim uh, raised? Yeah. Uh, I wanted to follow up specifically on the issue of political mediation. And I wanted to bring in um, a turn of phrase from uh, Walter Benjamin that Adolf Reed references at the start of his essay, Black Particularity Reconsidered, which we read on our annual syllabus as part of our new left readings. Um, so the phrase is something like mass reproduction requires the production of the masses. And I wanted to relate that to this issue of political mediation that Ephraim raised, because at the end of your talk, you mentioned how at the moment the masses are kind of reproduced through in the US, the Democratic Party, for instance, in a kind of, um, like a, a, a freezing way, a way that kind of freezes them or makes them objects of, the st of state management. Whereas the task would be for, you know, instead of people being organized to vote for Democrats, they'd be organized for socialist parties, I think the way that you put it. Um, but I wanted to kind of clear, I wanted to clarify or just, you know, further distinguish what would be happening there <laughs> in terms of, um, like why would a socialist party, which would, act, you know, in many ways it would actually participate in um, reproducing mass society, right? And in fact, that would be part of its goal. Um, but there's this issue of historical consciousness that sets apart um, the left from the right. I think you mentioned Kolokowski as well. And that's one of his points is that um, in his essay, an idea of the left, the concept of the left, is that um, the left is concerned with what are the historical possibilities expressed by the present moment. And the right is determined by the left then uh, for falling back on those possibilities. And, um, and so, you know, what would distinguish, what would distinguish the current left as the right if there were um, kind of an emancipatory politics in the form of some kind of mass international socialist party would be this kind of historical consciousness of the possibility of, of, of mass society. And so, um, yeah, I just wanted to get your, get your thoughts on that kind of further, further clarifying, because I think there's a way in which the way that you phrased it, and I, you know, it's not, it's not you, but I think there's a way in which that could be heard by someone in the audience, um, who it, it looks like it's a lot of platypus members, but let's let's imagine if it was like a Corbinista or a Bernie bro, um, they would hear that and they'd think like, yeah, like we just need to kind of use the right PR and we need to do the right kind of like um, research on the communities that we're trying to reach to mobilize them more effectively towards the correct policies. And so, um, you know, like I'm reminded of a anecdote from when there was uh, the DSA convention in Chicago. And I wasn't there, I was, I was in London at the time, but I remember hearing from, from other Platypus members who attended that, that they, asked, um, they asked Chris to come in uh, into the DSA to lead them because there was all of this unused libidinal energy that needed to be directed, right? <laughs> um, and, and so, yeah, I guess 
this reminds me of another point that I wanted to bring up and with respect to this kind of, this question of like, well, what distinguishes the way that the left would engage in this kind of authoritarianism as opposed to the right, um, which is a, a kind of illustration that Wilhelm Reich uses um, towards the end of that. Um, I think it's like the first chapter in his in the book you mentioned and what we read also on the annual syllabus where um, he says like this kind of libidinal energy that gets invested narcissistically and sadomasochistically in the fear of freedom could be kind of unleashed if turned outwards. Uh, so like the kind of libidinal energy that you see in the football stadium <laughs> is the kind of libidinal energy that is required in something like a revolution but is other being invested in, in other ways at the moment. Um, so yeah, so I just wanted to put all that on the table and, and see what you'd have to say. Thanks, uh, yeah, because I, I think, you know, it's not, uh, the danger is not just, uh, but we, we could do better PR, but it could, I, I envision a lot worse, right? People thinking we need to have, like to invite psychoanalysts to lead you know, workshops so that you can learn to overcome your own inner authoritarian or something like this in the DSA, right? Um, so not just PR, but like actual uh, um, attempts at psychoanalytical manipulation, as it were. Uh, and, and of course, that's uh, not at all the point. Um, and as you said, it is about history, and as Kilakowski said, right? Um, and as uh, um, Reich also makes clear, in that the authoritarian personality, like the authoritarian states, uh, are really products of a sort of failure of hope, right? It's because suddenly uh, uh, we, we don't hope for more, we don't, uh, um, there's sort of hopelessness and despair and nihilism that sets in so that we turn back onto ourselves uh, um, and we demand that the state takes back the control that we had taken very briefly. Um, and, so, and so that is about history, both uh, uh, for sort of subjective point of view or like individual subjective point of view and, and, and in terms of the party. And, that, and again, that's what the, the, the party is about, is both about keeping track of what has happened and what has failed before uh, so that something can be learned of it um, and then mobilizing that uh, uh, for an overcoming of present conditions. Um, that at least is what you know Marx says in the 18th, 18th premier and so on. And that without this, what you have is despair is also what he says in the, um, the class struggle in France in the um, 18th premier, right? After the failure of 1848, what you have is sort of massive depression, um, which you also have actually in Russia in, in the sort of late twenties, right? All these ex-revolutionaries become depressed and and retire in uh, uh, sanatoriums to uh, uh, just be kept alive because despair sets in. So, um, I mean, I don't know if that really addresses what you meant, but I, I, I do think that historical dimension is uh, uh, like, that's what it is, yeah. In response to something you just said about, um, like you fear, workshops led by psycho psychoanalysts well not even psychoanalysts but probably like cbt uh cognitive behavioral therapy you know counselors in the dsa that's something you fear um a, a thought occurred to me which was well there are these things called socialist night schools that the dsa does on topics like um like it, it'll be like the afro socialist caucus socialist night school and um, whenever I've gone to those events, the discussion is largely psychological <laughs> in terms of like um, the, you know, in terms of uh, people's like emotional responses to events or to oppression. 
And um, if there are readings assigned, they're usually not discussed. Not that that would change anything. <laughs> um, but um, so I'm, you know, I think it, it might be worse, which is not the kind of the psychological dimension. Like you don't even need to discipline, like it doesn't even require um, having uh, like a trained professional to, to kind of lead workshops in that way. But rather that's just kind of the default expectation that education quote unquote um, is for, for, for the DSA. Um, and yeah, I guess, um, yeah, I guess that's, that's, that's the end of the thought, sorry. <laughs> No, that's right. Uh, and Rebecca, I've seen you and uh, give you, let, let you speak in a second, but just to answer uh, David for a second. I mean, more concretely, you know, what did happen to Wilhelm Reich is indeed despair that there could ever be a, a revolution that wouldn't turn authoritarian or that wouldn't uh, turn a, a, a fascist, rather. And that's because he, th or at the end, he ends up thinking that the sexual revolution has to come first, right? And so uh, uh, the left, the new left's counterculture got that bit of, of Reich um, and did decide that perhaps what we need to do first is workshops or like, you know, communes where we uh, uh, liberate our sexuality and and that has not turned out well for uh, uh, the left. Um, so I don't think they well they might do this right. And it is like uh, workshops that would be led by sexologists. I can imagine that right to fight your inner uh, uh, your inner fascist or by the uh, uh, uh philosophers, right. Um, sadomasochist uh, workshops a la uh, Foucault, right? That's what Foucault thought, how, how we liberate ourselves is uh, uh, experiencing different forms of uh, pleasure and pain. And so, right, so I think that's, who knows um, what the future, what the left will uh, actually do um, if it hears this. Uh, but Rebecca, yes, sorry. Yeah, actually, this um, kind of ties in with uh, David's point, um, at least the, the later mention of, like, um, well, maybe it doesn't, I don't know. Uh, but I wanted to ask a question more about, you know, the way that I understand um, left's reaction or pathologization of um, the right, right, it's a fascist. Um, or so-called fascist is um, kind of like historical um, or like a defense of historical white supremacy, right? So it's actually like internalized privilege, which gives you like a hysterical reaction when that privilege is taken away. Um, and tying into kind of like, you know, this emerging history um, of like colonialism and slavery and Right, so it's it's like this, this kind of psychological approach where you're tying in historical events to a kind of like unconscious, um, like an, an unconscious, uh, I, I guess, racial identity or racial history, um, which actually then informs your your political positions um, if you're not, you know, disciplined enough to exercise them from you, uh, from yourself. So I, I I guess I wanted to hear your um your your thoughts on that, on this like. Um, I mean, I don't know what I would call this, like, um, this decolonial approach to psychology. I don't think it's even, I guess we have Fanon. I'm not too familiar with his approach to it. Um, yeah, I guess I wanted to hear your, your thoughts on that. So your microphone was a little bit shaky at, at times, and so I'm not so sure I fully understood, but I did, I think, get most of it. Um, I mean, so I see this, and maybe this is what you meant being mobilized by like the anti anti racist crowd as like this is why white people vote for Trump and uh, for fascists, and that's because like 
that even their symbolic power has been taken away from them because now they see black women in James Bond and that's uh, somehow traumatizing and therefore or like nostalgia for empire that's right it's like um, it's like the Brexit line right so it's people that put for Brexit are nostalgic for um a reigning Britain an independent Britain that had a kind of imperial force right which they completely might do and the left has the same nostalgia for the British Empire, right? Like the nostalgia for the 50s uh, that uh, Corbyn, etc., uh, uh, pour out all the time. That's like, you know, you, you do have, a, a, it's not like this is a privilege of, of the right. Um, that's uh, the problem with that is like that's a little bit simplistic right it's sort of too unmediated it's a sort of a, it's very much a sort of like cbt sort of approach to a, how subjectivity works and so maybe that's true you know that sort of uh, 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 sexuality doesn't appear in all of this uh, uh, sort of the history of humanity doesn't appear in all of this and we're just uh, um, children that when we when our toys are taken away from us, we cry and we lash out. Um, that's not exactly the sort of things that either uh, uh, Freud or the as far as I understand would take from it. And, and the way the people who think that this is what's going on, you know, do try to sort of uh, do therapy on white people um, to exercise that racism out of them, right? And I'm thinking of these, uh, that article about these uh, uh, white women, very wealthy white women in the US who pay thousands of dollars to have dinner with like trained race experts who spend uh, the whole dinner berating them and insulting them and telling them how racist they are, uh, right? Uh, this, uh, and so that, that all of this, right, like a lot of the um, uh, anti-racism or decolonial reaction that's happened, especially over the summer, uh, is really rooted in uh, anxiety. So people, or oh, guilt, right, sort of free-floating guilt. Like you have all of these people who are guilty, who feel guilty and they don't know why. And then you go on and you tell them, well, it's because, you know, your ancestors uh, raped people, your ancestors stole, and, and, and you have, and you're actually, uh, you yourself, uh, producing all of that violence all the time against uh, everybody uh, through microaggressions that you are not aware of and, uh, and that you need to be cured from, right? There's a way I understand it. Like, for instance, over the summer, the, the uh, when we did have Black Lives Matter protests in Denmark, uh, one of the coffee break participants that we organized at the time had asked one of their friends why they had reposted that black square on Instagram. And the, the, their friend says, I, I don't know. I just felt so guilty, you know, that, but I'm not sure why. Um, and so I, I do think that's what's being mobilized by that way of looking at things. And so the way that Haik, I think, would look at that free-floating guilt that's being mobilized for basically politic, uh, like democratic party marketing in different ways, um, is that it comes from uh, uh, sexual repression, right, from people wanting uh, to be free and feeling guilty for wanting to be free um, and therefore seeking punishment for it, right? I don't know if that makes yeah, sense. I don't know if that answers what you were asking, Rebecca. You just got tired all of a sudden. No, 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 no. Um, I, I guess I was just, you know, trying to relate this to like the absence of the left, right? Um, cause actually like within this, within this, um, this movement, um, it's recalling these kind of like, I don't know, like the ghostly figures of like the sixties, 
they the actual like colonial um uh international politics of the time right um so I, I just find it interesting the way that it's been being attached to like a psychological level um yeah. right and that's like the main form right it's, it's actually a way to avoid politics is is um you know converting it into something like an individual psyche yeah right but um yeah i don't i don't know i i guess i, I just wanted to gauge your your thoughts on, on on that whole thing yeah yeah yeah. no thanks that helps me uh, uh understand what you were getting at which is like both uh, uh, sort of anti-racist movement of the new left uh, and the uh, um, anti-imperialist movement, right, all get both get conflated into that sort of decolonial psychology sort of thing or anti-racist thing that uh, uh, ends up pr proposing therapeutic solutions, um, which are really like um, you know, uh, uh, like rehabilitation camps, uh, because there's been an abandon of anything like politics. Like I, I'm thinking of the the interviews we did with uh, uh, the uh, like some of the Black Panther uh, Party creators who looked at the uh, Black Lives Matter movement and were horrified by what they found. Right, precisely because they had given up any uh, any sort of ambition, political ambition, um, and of course, and you have the same in terms of uh, anti-imperialism. Like I'm thinking about Palestine right, in the Danish context, especially, especially uh, where you know revolutionaries in the 70s or like marxists in the 70s and 80s thought the revolution would start in palestine and therefore we should rob banks in denmark to send them money but also learn how to uh, train with weapons uh, in palestine so that we can then come back and like do the revolution and that was sort of uh, absurd and yet uh, there's something quite extraordinary about this compared to today where support for Palestine today is about buying a coffee at a sort of like left-wing coffee shop where some of the money will get sent to some NGO in Palestine that does education, right? And where it seems like half of Palestine now lives off of NGO money and the other one is starving. Um, so the, so, then that anti-racist training is like part of that same thing and i guess like the new left and even like in in the 80s uh, uh people sort of hippies could have imagined that yeah this is how we're going to fight racism and colonialism is like through uh, training people and education and uh all of that uh and today like very explicitly becomes a demand for like hr you know, uh, like human resources, uh, organizing workshops to train people to not be racist in the workplace, that sort of like, you know, like that episode of uh, The Office, um, one of the first episodes of The Office, right, where the, you have this sort of anti-racist anti trainer who comes and tells people that uh, um, being anti-racist is uh, about listening to each other and uh, describing situations that might seem racist and finding ways to resolve them and you know all of that stuff that a few years ago it was possible to make fun of that uh, uh, in the tv show and nowadays uh, that seems to be taken seriously by um, everybody um yeah but what, i don't know if sorry sorry if someone else who has a question who hasn't asked jump in but um otherwise victor can ask you a, another question sure um i wanted maybe you could say something a little bit more about the the example of the russian soldiers in 1905 i've always found that like a peculiar part of reich's essay mm. 
you mentioned at the start that Lenin only a decade or so earlier than Reich wrote had kind of rejected the, the necessity for a kind of role for psychoanalysis in the socialist movement and in Marxism. It feels like Reich kind of uses that to say like, look, Lenin was thinking about these problems because he, he the problem comes from Lenin, the example, mm. right? It like it's through Lenin, the story comes out. Um, and there's obviously, you know, one of the risks there is a kind of one sided reading about action. And what's interesting today is that the problem that people perceive in the authoritarianism of neo fascists or whatever is that they're, they're much too likely to act out. They don't have self control. They don't, you know, mm. they're, ju they're basically, you know, you just rub them up the wrong way and they'll like, you know, I don't know, kill the senator or something. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, how do you understand that kind of example and the, 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 this idea about, you said, converting it into action? Um, maybe you could say a bit, about more, a bit more about that. Yeah. Because hmm. I, you know, because the, the, the risk, the other risk, perhaps the same risk that you're pointing out is uh, um, what actually happened to a right, right? As I mentioned, that is that you might think that if the soldiers didn't like let themselves be killed ultimately uh it is because they were too repressed sexually and therefore that the solution is uh, uh to liberate sexuality to have the communist party organize a liberation of sexuality before the revolution right that this is what will allow it to happen um and this is what Hayek ends up thinking to some extent, right? Um, out of despair. The, um, yet I don't think that this is how he sees it in that text at the time, right? Uh, the way he understood it was that it's the same problem that Marxism has been facing since 1848. Um, and this is just the way that it is being articulated now, or that uh, uh, this is the language that's available to us to make sense of this because the parties disappeared and so on. And uh, and as, as David was saying, the solution is the same, right? It is history, uh, though um, perhaps in a, uh, with a different twist or um, a more complicated way of looking at history um, because of the failure of all of this. Um, and because the difference, so of course, like the fascists were already acting out in the 30s. Um, and so it's not like all but it, right, so it's not like uh, uh, um, all action has become impossible, but rather that all action apart from acting out and lashing out uh, is, is what um, characterizes um, fascism or any, the libidinal energy is being uh, uh, outpoured, but in a uh, in a masochistic way rather than uh, uh, in a emancipatory way as it were um, yeah i'm not i'm not sure if i can uh, um, articulate that more clearly right now if i'm there's is it okay if i jump in on this conversation yes. um there's another example not to like muddy things up too much but there's another example this reminds me of of um from Engels in his 1895 preface to the civil war in France where he's talking about well what's changed are the class struggle in France sorry 
Um, because he's saying, what's changed since this was first written in, you know, 1848 <laughs> and or in response to the 1848 revolutions. Um, and he, he's like, well, there's been this development of social democracy in the form of the party. And you have these, these like mass, this is kind of like mass international socialist party. Um, and he kind of talks about the task at hand as being um, comparable to uh, the Christians in Rome. Mm. where it's you know the christians in rome joined the army and then rome had to become christian <laughs> um and so he's talking about like how the party is kind of developing this um army for the revolution and then through these social democratic parties and it's kind of posing the question of the revolution at like a higher more conscious level because you have these people trained in theory and practice uh, for for that revolution. And they're kind of in a position in which as kind of soldiers of that revolution, they could they could act. So like it poses the possibility of political and social action per se, the development of those parties. Whereas like without that, <laughs> um, and, 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 and like just before I say without that, like in Lenin's time, certainly like that's like, you know, he's talking about like Lenin's dealing with uh, like highly, highly artic politically articulated um, political contestation within political parties uh, in a revolutionary circumstance. Um, and, and, and Reich is very close to that moment, although he's on the, on the other side of the failure of 1917 reflecting on that. But without, with the liquidation of those parties, um, yeah, like action. And this is why I kind of brought up the DSA example of like, there's all this liberal energy and we just need someone to like tell us what to do. Um, that's not quite <laughs> like if only if it was if only if only it was that simple. Um, but yeah, I yeah, I guess. And then there's another question I wanted to ask. And I don't uh, if you if you're still kind of responding to Ephraim's questions, feel free. But I just want to add this into the mix while I have the mic. Um, but uh, what is the historical possibility of mass society, um, and what would what would politically organizing it like? What, what are the possibilities there? Um, is it to uh, you know better administer per, like social production? Um, is it to overcome the need for masses uh, by taking up the mass? You know, like what like what would that look like, and and how does that relate to this problem? But that's a bigger question, and I. But anyways, I'll let you uh, respond however you however you want. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a lot. Um, Yeah, as you say, right. So, so, I mean, I'm yeah, I'm not sure where. Yeah, I'm getting tired. But um, the um, as you said, this is a problem that goes back to 1848, and where you do have the sort of outpouring of libidinal energy anyway. Uh, you do have things happening anyway, and the way that manifests uh, after 1848 is terrorism already. Right and is like uh, um, uh, like you have communes as well, but you do have uh, all of that uh, um, attempts at violence, at murdering Napoleon himself uh, uh, that fail, uh, and and all that emigre milieu of French revolutionaries in London that are fighting each other sometimes literally in duels etc because really there's a sort of need for aggressivity uh, that just collapses onto itself right and so the, the left turns against itself and, and already decomposes at the time um and and what happens in uh 1918 is is already that as well always a continuation of that and so uh, uh the violence both of the Freikorps, but then also of the Stalinians. Um, and after the, the the Second World War, right? I mean, generally you have a sort of outpouring of, of 
uh, violence um, that corresponds to that failed, that need to repress the potential. Like it's that emancipatory potential that turns it to, that turns against itself and that libidinal energy that turns against itself to repress itself, right? Um, um, is the way I understand it. The, the, and in the, like what, what I was saying when you were saying like, uh, what I was thinking when you said, you know, the DSA who, uh, who just wants someone to tell them what to do Indeed, as you said, if only it was that, that's not such a problem, right? Uh, wanting to have someone tell you what to do. Uh, that is being disciplined by something, um, by someone who is hopefully an emanation of yourself too. Uh, that's what the party is, right? And so in that sense, that would be great. Uh, like that's in a way the point is using that authoritarianism to move on, um, going through it. But beyond this, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if I have any uh, answer to give. Sorry. Um, any other, oh, yeah, oh, go ahead, David, if you want to uh, go on. Or oh, if anyone wants to say. Uh... Hi, um, may I ask something? Yeah. Um, so um, thanks for the talk. Um, I wanted to ask how the original conference responded to your, um, the, you know, your original presentation of this talk. Right. Uh, that's... I thought that was really interesting, right? Partly because uh, so Problema is a group that emerges kind of in parallel to Platypus, right? It's like one of these uh, uh, leftist intellectual groups that emerge after 2008 to sort of make sense of what's going on and, and what to do. And in Denmark, it emerges against the Marxists, but with a similar fascination for May 68, which for them is a fascination for Lacan um, and for Freudo Marxism, uh, but with less of a like Castoriadis and so on, as far as I understand, more than uh, uh, the Marxist bit. Um, and as soon as I finished talking, uh, especially like saying that last bit, so I, I didn't give all these examples of uh, like uh, millennial um, authoritarianism that much, uh, I sort of condensed it was just one paragraph, which perhaps was a bit more punchy. And so I finished on this, there was a, a silence and the, the moderator, the first thing she said was that she had expected violence to uh, like people to start shouting or people to start attacking me physically uh, after this. Uh, and she was surprised that there was a, a silence. Uh, which I thought was great. Um, and then the, um, what people were most interested in explicitly was uh, the sort of political potential. Like why indeed uh, are we sitting around talking about stuff rather than doing something? I, 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 that's the way I understood what they were saying. Right, like what's the point of just talking about things, which is a uh, disappointing, but uh, kind of interesting. And, and the question of the party was raised in that sense for them. Uh, and that's the way they understood it. Uh, and I tried to sort of uh, uh, correct it, uh, but I, I do guess that's one way in which this can be understood. And, and um, the other thing or where people were shocked or like uh, where, where there were sort of more intense discussions that came from the one person who was most involved uh, in um, thinking through Adorno and the Frankfurt School, 
And he thought that the idea that the workers are responsible for the failure of uh, Marxism in the first half of the 20th century was completely outrageous. The idea that the left is responsible for uh, uh, the Holocaust and so on, you know, because of their failure, uh, that that was outrageous. And he said that if Adorno and Horkheimer write that sort of stuff in the 40s, it's because they're suffering from survivor's guilt, right? It's a sort of pathological uh, uh, manifestation of their guilt. Um, and we should sort of uh, feel sorry for them, uh, but we shouldn't listen to that stuff, right? That's like trauma speaking, which, uh, and that was coming from the person who was most interested in Adorno. Uh, the rest, most of the others were like really into Lacan and Zizek and Latin Dollar and uh, all of that. And so um, I thought that was quite extraordinary. Um, you know, that the way in which as often, right, that fascination for Marxism and for the Frankfurt School really comes out of a profound disgust uh, uh, at it, right? The, the complete uh, people finding it completely abhorrent and um, being fascinated by it. Um, and then the rest is more difficult to pinpoint because uh, so they had a sort of a few elders, as it were, um, like professors or like old psychoanalysts, and they uh, that were clearly highly regarded and respected, and they mostly refused to address what I'd said. Um, oh, one other thing, so that comes out of the sort of Lacanianism was uh, that they thought that the very idea of overcoming capitalism was pathological. Right, that it was a desire to do away with, uh, I don't know how they phrase it in Lacanese, uh, but like uh, uh, to do away with lack and to have a smooth something or to do away with the object, little a, I don't know. But they thought that the very idea of overcoming capitalism was pathological. Um, and that it could only th happen through violence precisely because it was pathological. So really they used psychoanalysis to dismiss uh, uh, Marxism as uh, itself pathological uh, and to dismiss Marxists like Adorno as pathological. Um, yeah, uh, but then others were really interested. Uh, and what was also kind of uh, funny is that I ended on that, on saying, you know, we can keep making fun of Trump, you know, and the, the funny orange man. Uh, and the next talk was precisely about how Trump is a clown and Trump as the clown figure and so on. And so I, I, I think I preempted a lot of what was, I was one of the early presentations and I preempted a lot of what was going on afterwards. And um, yeah, I don't know if that helped the conversation. We'll see, so we're, they're preparing a, a special issue of their little, uh, of their publication. And so hopefully we might be able to see sort of fuller responses uh, in print to uh, all of that, to what I said. It did sort of dominate a lot of the discussions afterwards. A lot of the points that I made were brought up, not necessarily just by me, uh, but throughout the, the two days. So it did seem to matter. Yeah. They were very nice about it, I have to say. I wanted to add one last thing. I've been kind of distracted, so I hope this isn't a repetition of what's already been said. Uh, but the question of what to do, right? So Adorno has this category of pseudo action. And so the point with pseudo action, which he characterizes of the political action of the 60s, 
is that it's not simply that the tendency is authoritarian or people are thinking the wrong way and that's why they can't act. But what makes it pseudo action compared to actual action is that you're not really changing the object you're trying to deal with, right? The actual action would be action that changes the object, changes reality. Uh, and so what pseudo action is, is when that uh, relationship to why Benjamin will say what fascism does, the absence of being able to change, and that these people think this is an objective problem. Adorno would think this implicates his ability to do theory at all that if the world isn't changing, is this even theory anymore? Uh, and so I think our kind of humble tactic is just to say, look, what the left professes to do, it's not even doing, uh, and what is that about? <laughs> right. Um, yeah, and, and, and uh, you know, you, your article on Platypus as a psychoanalyst of the left, I think is really quite clear on this. Um, and, and that's kind of what I was trying to do by mentioning the protests, right? The summer protests uh, against police violence that end up uh, demanding more police violence. Uh, um, and I think, yeah. Yeah. Like, I, I know that's from left field. I just. No, 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 no. I think we're not does, we're not here to tell people like that you have the wrong theory and that's why it's not working and that we're supplying the right theory. Rather, all we're saying is what your aims are, you're not even achieving with your actions. Right. You're not even trying often. Right. Um, like where it's not because you know you if people were trying to do something and failing at it, uh, uh there would still almost be an action as it were, right? It would be a failure, but it's not clear that we're even dealing with failures, right? We're dealing with non-attempts, pseudo-attempts. Um, that sort of ironic attempts, right? Everything is, is always a, a sort of pretend. Um, and Adorno is, is clear on this. Uh, both at the level of theory and practice, right? That fascists do not actually believe that Hitler is, you know, all that great and whatever. Like the, the sort of ideology is pseudo ideology uh, and, and the action is pseudo action uh, because no one believes in it. Um, unlike the ideologies that came before where people really did think something could be achieved and then try to do it. Um, and today, yeah, it's, uh, we're not even there, right? Um, for the, or, or rather like the, you know, the explicit left is the, the set of organizations that make sure that action really is only pseudo action that uh, thinking really is only just pseudo thinking. And whenever they see something that seems to express a real desire to work, for instance, uh, they denounce it, they attack it. Or, um, and they... I mean, the polemical thing to say is that we might just be pseudo activity and pseudo thinking too, but at least we're aware of the impasse that, that expresses, that it's an, it's an objective problem. It's not that people aren't trying hard enough or don't want the right thing, but there's an actual impasse and ability for action to transform the world. And all we're doing is highlighting that problem, I think. Right. And with, you know, the very recourse of psychoanalysis is, as I tried to put it, right, even more uncertain than it already was for Adorno, because psychoanalysis is not even, uh, you know, adapting people to society anymore. Uh, psychoanalysis has mostly disappeared. Um, and, and when it appears, psychoanalysts are quite, you know, the, the ones that are uh, self-aware a little bit, are concerned with the very possibility, with, with its ineffectivity, right? With the, the difficulties they have in doing anything or the, the yeah. Uh, like I, I was reading uh, that Charles Menman guy, um, who's not, I think, even a leftist, and he's not like Christopher Lash. He's an actual psy uh, practicing psychoanalyst, 
and saying, you know, we, the sort of subjectivities we have uh, the demand psychoanalysis today or that get psychoanalysis imposed on them uh, by parents or, or family. Today, it's not clear that anything can be done because all the, all the sort of, you know, parts uh, uh, that used to work as one coherent, kind of coherent whole before have just, are just not there. There's no desire, there's no, uh, uh, demand, uh, there's no lack. So, uh, yeah, on, on, sorry, on that mm -hmm. note, I sent Leone an essay that relates to the point that I was raising about Adorno. Uh, it's called The Obsolescence of the Freudian Ideal of Man. And there basically he says, perhaps Freud is obsolescent, that we are even more regressed since Freud's time. And right, it's not a good thing, but it should be something that should be considered. And Victor, I also liked how you put that psychoanalysis, like the reliance on psychoanalysis is itself regression, is itself a kind of problem, not something to be upheld as a solution. Right. And even more today, because we just don't know what psychoanalysis even means, right? It's like it's, it's be, if, if in the 30s it was necessary as against or as a sort of a, a retrieval of Marx, today, Freudian psychoanalysis doesn't even have that purchase on reality that it used to have. And so it seems that we need to go through Adorno in order to get to Freud, in order to get to Marx, perhaps, right? Um, but what, yeah, like there is a, a real impasse at the level of, of thinking and even uh, any further regression in relation to, uh, uh, yeah, to, to what, to the situation that um, William Reich was facing. And Theo says uh, that the obsolescence of the Freudian, Freudian notion of the ego is exactly what makes it critical, which sure, right, and same with uh, Marxism, but it's not what, like, you know, I'm thinking of what uh, uh, someone like um, Zizek is doing Zizek and Vladimir Dolar and the whole Slovenian school. I don't know, right? Well, although Zizek does, I guess, I have to stop following, but he does kind of raise the question of what can be psychoanalysis today. I don't know. All right, I think we're at time. Maybe this is a good place to stop unless there's another last question, pressing concern, comment. All right, well, thank you very much for um, going through this. Um, tomorrow in Aarhus, but that means online on Zoom, we're having a coffee break on um, Nietzsche on the left. So you're welcome to attend. Um, it's from 12.30 to 2.30, I think. There's the event on the Facebook group. Uh, ask me if you want to uh, know more and you don't have access to the group. Otherwise, um, have a good night, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Victor. Thanks, Great Victor. job. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Thanks.